for another fun day at Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Lynn Elias. I'm here alone today. Greg deserted me. No, he didn't really desert me. He's, he's off being a good son and doing some great things with his parents. But Greg will be back here next week. But irrespective of that, I'm going to get in trouble all by myself uh, with some help from some wonderful friends. Uh, my friend, TCM pal Kelly Pratt who has the distinct moniker this year of being one of the new social producers at TCM Film Festival this week. Kelly is going to be here uh, calling in live at 1115 to talk about TCM Film Festival with me, as well as her what her, she's planning for all the fe, uh, festival fans this week. And at 1130, we're going to get into a whole lot of trouble with my two favorite trouble dolls as they talk their film, Apartment Troubles, Jess Weixler, Jennifer Prediger, it has been an absolute joy to go on the ride with them from the premiere and the debut of the film at L.A. Film Festival to having a distribution deal and the film being made available for everybody this week. So that is that's something I'm looking forward to. And then we've got a lot of exclusive interview clips uh, with Todd Lieberman, producer, executive producer of Insurgent. Todd talks to me about bringing in Robert Schwenke as the director this time, expanding the vision of Insurgent while maintaining the core ethic of the story of Triss. Delightful, delightful, delightful trip down memory lane for me, talking with Hal Blaine and Don Randy for The Wrecking Crew. Anybody that's ever picked up an album over the past 40 years, you've heard these gentlemen play. Hal Blaine, one of the most noted drummers in the history of music, of rock and roll. Don Randy, still... An incredible keyboard player who plays every week at the Baked Potato in Studio City. And everybody needs to go hear him if you haven't. So we'll hear what they have to say. And then Ethan Hawke has directed a documentary. A wonderful, very pers- interpersonal documentary interviewing Seymour Bernstein. Called Seymour Bernstein, An Introduction. And I had a chance to talk with Seymour, who is one of the loveliest men you will ever hope to meet and it was a very unique thesis and idea on art and life and their interaction how they intertwine and the great connection of how music speaks to all of us so we got a lot of music going on today too but right now i promised everyone last week i talked to virginia madsen at length about her appearance in the film walter and she was giving me a lot of insight into acting coaches and how important she finds having an acting coach. And because so many of you out there that I know are listening are actors, I think a lot, I wanted to make sure that you get to hear this whole excerpt of what she has to say about acting coaches and how beneficial they are. You mentioned what I found really interesting is you mentioned you still have an an acting coach. Oh yeah. There are so many, especially of of today's generation, they poo-poo and they dismiss the idea of an acting coach. How beneficial is an acting coach for a performer? Well, you know, I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. And and for me, it's, it's excellent. You know, for me, it's really important to have someone who looks at a script objectively not thinking of themselves and and helps me break it down in a really you know in a in, in a really common sense way he's not the kind of coach that goes into the mystical world of 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 acting moments you know he does it in a really and it, and, it, and it reflects sort of my character as a person mm-hmm. and and he, he breaks it down and and finds sort of like little gems and surprises like did you ever think of this and did you ever look at this and I'm kind of like ah oh. you know so it's just having you know it's, it's having extra input mm-hmm. um and which which is very useful for me kind of like that um, third eye you know I mean like look if I was if I was uh, a ballerina I would be I would have to you know train every morning um if I was you know if I was an athlete I would have to train every day mm-hmm. make my instrument stronger and I feel that acting is the same you you can't just sit around and take it for granted that you're going to open your mouth and be brilliant mm-hmm. 
I think that is something that anybody that has read my reviews over the years, that is often the enunciation, pronunciation, the diction, the cadence of that vocal instrument that Virginia talks about is something that so many young actors in particular, they don't have the training, they don't exercise that vocal muscle, and it does make all the difference in the world in a performance. People will joke and laugh and talk about how much better everything sounds with a British accent. Most individuals, most performers with a British accent enunciate. They use their diaphragm. They speak extremely well. So acting coaches, vocal instruments, great advice from Virginia Madsen. And you didn't even have to pay to go to her acting class to get it. So I've been promising and talking about it for a couple weeks and I'll talk about it for the rest of the year, is pushing for Oscar. Cinderella. Um, it, is, uh, it is pure enchantment. It is a delight. And so much of that is due to director Ken Brana and his vision. And I had a chance to talk to him at the recent press day the week before the film opened uh, and got his feedback on designing the tonal bandwidth and the whole look of the film. And as he describes it, it's very classical. Classic cinema shot with classic cinematic tools. And in light of TCM Film Festival this week, it seems very appropriate that you get to hear directly from Ken Brana and what he had to say about Cinderella. Ken, you have outdone yourself oh. with this film. Oh, thank you very much. This is its poetic, it's lyrical, it is masterful. Oh. And I'm already talking Oscar on this film. Oh, well, I tell you what, I'd be, if I was a betting man, I'm not allowed to say things like this. I can't believe that Sandy Powell and Dante Ferretti wouldn't have a bit of a... But anyway, that's enough. That's for another, that's another, <laughs> that's another, that's another, this whatever. Is a, this is a perfect marriage of your cinematic understanding your love of classic old Hollywood and film and theater. 
how did, uh, particularly, how did you and Harris go about developing your visual tonal bandwidth for this film? You've got your sweeping, your pan, your crane shots that go down and yeah. swoop, yeah. much like the little CGI bluebirds do. Yeah, yeah. And everything goes in tandem with your score which runs through the entire film. Well, we kept, we kept talking really early on between all of those key department heads. So we would sit down and I would talk with, thanks very much, with uh, uh, Patrick Doyle, our composer, Harris Ambalukos, our DP, Sandy Powell, costumes and, and, and Dante Ferretti, and we would talk about what was required. Um, and we would reference uh, movies like, for what it's worth, Gone with the Wind, um, uh, for, the, for the ballroom sequence, and, and The Wizard of Oz, and uh, one of Dante's films, The Age of Innocence, and Visconti He's the leopard. Um, Amelie, uh, for some of those shots, you may recall in Amelie, there's a, some delicious uh, sweeping shots that will seem to us to be possibly uh, uh, a kind of reference for a sort of delight in romance um, and in and in, in a sort of um, passion and uh, you know and love really, an expression of love, and that the. The, the desire was to bring the audience immersively into this world. So we wanted to take people to the ball. And when I watched Age of Innocence, a film, an underrated film, I think, is a masterpiece, um, I felt as though I'd smelt the flowers and I'd, I'd, I'd touched the table linen and I was, I, was, I was back in 19th century New York. And in our world, we wanted to take people on that sort of sensory experience. So with every scene, every sequence, every bit of storyboarding, we were trying to work out how all of those departments uh, married, and uh, it was a thrill, it was a thrill to do. The, you know, the, the invitation cinematically to do something like the, the return from the ball, um, the clock strikes midnight, and all the fun you could have. Just even for me, it was fun to watch Lily running in that dress. You know, she's got this quite tomboyish thing about her, and she uh, she's incredibly elegant and beautiful, so she could do both. She could look wonderful, and then somehow, you know, she <laughs> <laughs> she could just sort of get her sneakers on and, and that just felt part of the, the charm of Cinderella. So to start that and then have the fun of what you might do with the transformation of the, you know, this beleaguered coach driver who happens to be a goose uh, pull, pulled out of a perfectly happy evening to do this. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a lovely invitation. And we, we, although we, CGI was used in part there, we, we, we just had this um, already established difference, which is that we're live action and so, so some connection to the beating heart of the film is different because of it. Um, but the real, um, you know, the, 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 the modern part of it was really about just bringing her spirit and character and soul out into the movie so that she just wasn't waiting for a fella, uh, wasn't passive, and, and where you felt that there, was, there were reasons why she stays. Um, so it was, we felt live action could deliver these moments and, and deliver them because they're classic moments um, and, and that's where I spent lifetime working in material that I already know works um, and where, and it's unusual with this film, you sit down and watch it and you realize everybody in the audience knows what's going to happen, the five-year-olds to the 95-year-olds. So it's not what's going to happen, it's how's you, how are you going to do it? Um, and we, we, we felt confident that we would find that the how. You know, adding so much to the visual tone of the, and the story itself, Ken, is your use of color and the fact that you shot on film and went with the Panavision lenses. What were, I, I'm thrilled that you did. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled. What were your, your, your reasonings for shooting on film and then your decisions in terms of color with your rich blues, your greens, your golds, and the development of that color throughout the film? I, again, it was a kind of uh, a, a, a cross conversation. Uh, Harris Ambalukos did Thor with me, and uh, we also shot that on film. And when we talked about some of the films we referenced and some of the kind of uh, lushness that we were after, um, the, the, the notion of, of shooting on film became something that we were all excited by. We also felt that sort of um, in the curious paradox of it, although we were talking about a world of magic that had been uh, in many people's minds a cartoon, we wanted strangely to try and make it feel as real as possible. So Dante Ferretti was forever saying no blue screen, no green screen, no I want to build it. So that ball was a 360 uh, construction that uh, meant that when all those extras and all our characters walked in there, you really did feel you were in the the real place. No extra imagination was required when we were when we were shooting it. So uh, we weren't trying to be particularly sort of old-fashioned, but we just felt that the the uh, there was a, a kind of it was a classical approach to it, and so uh, we looked for some of the classical tools, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the the cinema game. And that was Ken Brana talking with me about all things Cinderella. And over the weeks, you've heard all about Swarovski. 
and a few other little gems. Pun intended, people. Uh, but right now, we're going to get class, even more classic in, in a few minutes when Kelly Pratt joins us uh, live, calling from Kansas, uh, before she sets forth on her own yellow brick road to come out to Hollywood tomorrow for the TCM Film Festival. But we're going to take a break right now, and we'll be right back. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we are back on Behind the Lens. And I am absolutely, utterly thrilled that I get to announce that my pal Kelly Pratt is on the line with us. Well, hello. Hello, you, little Miss Outspoken and Freckled. <laughs> no, that is really the best blog name as far as describing me anyway. I think it is. I think it's perfect. And any, cla <laughs> any classic film fans out there, you have to go check out Kelly's blog. She writes some really great stuff, has really great in-depth knowledge on classic film, and is one of the biggest, most exuberant and ebullient fans I know. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if I know a lot uh, compared <laughs> to the scholars on classic film, but enthusiastic, yes, definitely that. I don't think anybody tops your enthusiasm, Kelly. <laughs> Very nice. Now, and you get to have this illustrious title. You are one of the new social producers during TCM Film Fest this week. Yes, how exciting is that? Cool new program. So, for everybody that's listening, and we do have a lot of classic film fans, I just met a few the other night again from Alaska that watch TCM all the time and are sad, oh, they, awesome. and are sad they couldn't be here for the festival this week, but I know that Deb and Randy are listening up in Alaska. So, tell us, all, tell us all what a TCM social producer is for this debut at the fest this year. Yes, I think, I think they discovered last year... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm waiting for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that they realized not only how important social media is, uh, as far as, you know, gaining and reaching out to a better audience. And we are a very loyal and engaging audience uh, for TCM. They are the most hardcore fans you can find, um, are fans of TCM. And they, I really think, I think they got a lot of positive feedback mm -hmm. regarding the social media buttons. They kind of had a fun little program at last year's festival, and so this year they came up with this new idea of, you know, pitch us your best idea of how you would do social media and spread the word while at the festival. And so I pitched my idea, and there are about 20 of us, actually. Mm -hmm. And each of us kind of has a slightly different role. My idea regarding uh, trivia. So um, basically we're going out there and whether we're waiting in line or we're rushing from one theater to another, we are, you know, asking folks trivia questions. And I did that idea because I knew that that was something that people love also. They love to share their knowledge of how much they are passionate and know about classic film. Mm-hmm. Now, will you have your handy-dandy TCM 40,000 trivia questions in your hand? <laughs> well, I'm not going to promise 40,000, but I hope to have quite a few, let's just say. And we'll have about probably 50 buttons that we're going to pass out each day of the festival. And that's just from me. And by the way, I have to add a shout-out to my isn't Aurora, partner. Aurora's doing this with you, isn't she? Yes, and basically uh, we we kind of, I pitched the ideas, we're kind of the uh, Lucy and Ethel or Tina Fey and <laughs> Amy Poehler of classic film, and um, if you've met either one of us, we're, we're both very enthusiastic and excited about it, and not shy <laughs> at all. 
Um, as, as most of these social producers, I'm sure, would say the same thing about themselves. Well, and in the capacity of social producer, I don't think you can be shy because it is all about engaging with fans. But also, there are plenty of people, as you know from all the prior fest, there are so many people down on Hollywood Boulevard during the fest, and they're asking questions about the festival. Oh, sure. It's a big deal. I mean, this is, you know, a lot of people, there are many people out there. We won't say a lot. We'll say there are many. They like to poo-poo classic film. But, you know, as I have always said, as my dad always preached to me from small on, you have to know where the history comes from to understand where it is now and where it's going in the future. And that's true of of any history. So film is no different, for sure. And especially with all the technology and the way it changes and it's, you know, the metaphor, the interpretation and all the societal changes. Now this exactly. year, now this year we've got a really cool theme this year I think. His- speaking of history. Speaking of history, yes, speaking of history, <laughs> we've got a really cool film uh theme going this year. Uh TCM has come up with History in Hollywood. Yeah, that's a, it's a fascinating way that they're looking at this because I think they're also not only looking at how Hollywood, you know, through the lens of Hollywood how Hollywood has interpreted interpreted um, history, but also tell us your story. They want to hear about our stories, too. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you are extremely excited about at the Fest this year? Um, You know, it's tough because there's, I mean, you know, I get excited about all the classic films, and I've always been a fan of really all the genres. And for me, comedy is a big one. So, you know, seeing uh, my fellow cans and my buddy, Buster Keaton, is going to be, you know, having a showing um, at Steamboat Bill Jr., that's, that's going to be a blast. Mm-hmm. I love seeing a uh, silent film. And in Kansas, in my home state, we're very lucky because we get uh, a lot of history, speaking of history, connected to silent film. Aren't we? But, ju- we're just tying oh, everything together here, aren't we? <laughs> well, and, you know, the other thing, too, is, um, you know, we, there's such a diverse array of films that really, no matter what your your area of specialty or if you are eclectic, there's no way you're not going to see something you don't like here. I mean, everything is, is and, and there's so many films, so many screenings from silence to noir to pre-code to... Mm-hmm. You know, and then they're introducing some newer films, too. But I guess one of the other exciting things uh, that I think they really amped up this year is the star power. There are some big names coming to the fest this year. Oh, my. Tell me about it. I mean, we're going to the stars and beyond. We've got Jim Lovell showing up this year. Come on. I mean, when we go, when they take us to, when they're talking stars, they're taking us into the stars uh, this year, and I just, yeah. it's, I mean, it is amazing, the the lineup that they have. I'm just, I'm expecting my my red carpet tip sheet to sometime today or tomorrow morning, and the only thing I've heard is it's very long, with all the people <laughs> they expect to have on the opening night red carpet. You will be very busy. Anyone who's a member of the press will be very, very busy. Let's put it that way. Now, just and now you won't. You'll see this when we put the video together and Lydia gets it out. Hopefully, you know on Wednesday before the fest starts. But in your honor and your love of comedy, I brought my classic, the Screwball Comedy Films book, which is prominently displayed here. Nice. Yes, and I I brought it. Just because I know you do love comedy so much. That is, that's kind of my, my thing, or my shtick, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you planning on going to any of the special events at the festival? Uh, like, I think one of the biggest ones, obviously, is going to be Sophia Loren being interviewed by her son, Eduardo. I would love to catch that. I, would, I mean, you know, talk about big names. Um, you don't I, get too much bigger than Sophia Loren, unless... Really? I mean, seriously. But then we got Shirley MacLaine, too. Yes. I, I would. I want to capture, if I can, I, you know, that's the, the challenge 
the, uh, I should say, the nice, fun challenge is, you know, if you could only clone yourself so that you can somehow capture all of these screenings and special events and appearances somehow, you know, all at the same time. But they do a pretty good job of, of trying to stagger things, especially when it comes to the, you know, those big interviews, mm-hmm. whether it's Shirley MacLaine or... Sophia Loren or Nor Norman Dustin Hoffman. I mean, there, there are some yeah. seriously big names here. <laughs> there, yeah, there are. And then, of course, opening night, I think we have one of the most most looked-for, awaited reunions in the history of film, The Sound of Music. As, as we uh, know from the Oscars this year, um, you know, even with the younger generation, um, that's a classic for all ages. Yeah, is the sound of music. So and, you know, Neil Patrick Harris joked and said, you know, said, "Oh, we got a water cooler moment coming up with Lady Gaga." And I, I, and I think you even saw my tweet. I was tweeting out, "No, Lady Gaga singing sound of music stuff is not a water cooler moment." Now, if, if Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer show up, then it's a water cooler <laughs> moment. And then, of course, Julie walked out. And lo and behold, <laughs> we got Julie. But we're going to be lucky enough that we're not only going to have Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer, but we're getting a lot of the SOM7, too, if not all of them. That's, that is the rumor on the street, yes. So that's something I am so looking forward to myself, is to see that reunion take place. Honestly, I think that's the hottest ticket in town, for sure. There's no way that that isn't going to be the... Uh, the place to be now as a social producer will you get to be on the carpet on a thursday night well i myself know i would love to say that i was um the we what we only had like so many tickets is my understanding to pass out because again this is the hottest ticket in town Mm -hmm. um so there are some of our social producers are going to be there and um You know, I'm thinking that hopefully I can get the full list of who all we are, I think, uh, pretty soon here in the next couple of days. And then I know that I'll be pushing that out to everyone so that they know who to look for. Mm -hmm. And um, because each of us does take on a different specialty, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so while Aurora, and again, that's Citizen Screen, and and my hashtag is IrishJayhawk66, um, we'll be covering trivia, and you'll even see some video links for that as well as we engage live. But other folks will be doing video. Some will be covering the red carpet. Some will do the hand and footprint ceremony. So everyone's got kind of a different role and a different way mm-hmm. to engage and, and get the messaging out. Are there any of the special events that you know that you're going to, going to get to attend? Well, I want to see if I can catch Sophia Loren, Shirley <laughs> McCoy, uh, and Margaret. I really honestly want to be able to see all of them. So I will be doing my best to, to get to as many of those big events as, as much as possible. See, that's always my problem, too. It's, it's like what, and half the time I will forego screenings in order to go to the events. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward mm-hmm. to... James Layton and David Pierce. I just got their book, The Dawn of Technicolor. Oh, yeah. Which, for, sure. for a techie geek like me, uh, I'm like in heaven with the thing. So I definitely want to come and see them. Uh, Mike Kaplan is going to be there with his new book, Gotta Dance, The Art of the Dance movie posters. Which is very cool, too. That's, I mean, oh, beyond. There really, there really isn't. That's why I said you cannot. While we classic film fans have, again, you know, different ways that we express our passion, um, I don't think there's anything that that is at this film that isn't going to appeal to someone. I mean, everything is, whether you're, you know, scholarly about it or you're more techie about it, um, you're, you know, more uh, old, old school and Mm -hmm. in silence or or maybe a little more golden era, but... there's honestly nothing that you are not going to be happy with. <laughs> well, I know. I'm also looking forward to an, seeing an old friend, ter, stuntman Terry Leonard. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Who, mm-hmm. Terry will be doing an entire presentation. A lot of people don't, anybody that knows me knows, I started out in production and worked second unit with all of these stunt guys. I first met Terry back on Fall Guy. And he'd been brought into the business by a lot of the old legends, uh, Al Wyatt, Neil Summers, Chuck Roberson. And uh, I mean, he's doubled Michael Douglas over the years. He doubled Rock Hudson all through McMillan and Wife. Wow. So, talk about history. Yeah. So I think Terry's going to be fascinating to listen to him talk. Well, and, you know, who doesn't like Raiders of the Lost Ark? So that's going to be, you know, just... Like I said, there's whether you look at it from the technical aspect and learn things that you had no idea about straight from, you know, people who were there and lived it and did it themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, we have directors coming. We have, you know, so it's it's such a, a mixed bag If for folks that like to get more into the educational side of it, for folks that just want to experience the big screen, you know, the... Because I, for example, um, you know, seeing a film on the big screen, especially in one of these historic, speaking of history, mm-hmm. historic theaters, it, it brings a whole new level to the viewing experience, especially with an audience. Absolutely. Um, you just, it's just not the same. And, um, you know, that's why people scrimp and save their pennies all year long to come to this event, because it's, it means that much. Uh, you're coming in tomorrow. I will see you probably sometime on Wednesday. Uh, definitely. So I can't thank you enough for calling in today, Cal. Everybody, and when you get that list of everybody, make sure I get it, and I will get it out there on all of my social media stuff and the website and all of that cool stuff. Well, we appreciate that, and I think this will really enhance the experience for everyone. So I, thanks again for having me on. Oh, anytime, Cal, and I will see you following that yellow brick road down Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Kelly. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. And now, which one of you do I have here? <laughs> you have Jennifer Prediger for sure. I'm not sure if Jess is there, is she? Well, she is, and I'm going to push her buttons. You like this. I'm pushing buttons today. I'll push our buttons. You know, I, I, I'm getting into trouble here today, Jen. You know, I, I'm being technically challenged, trying to get to work two phones at one time here and merge you. Oh. And I think, well, are you there, Jess? Yes. Hello. <gasps> oh my God! Did I did it! I did it! This was. Oh my the, God! You're a genius, Debbie. I, I connect. Well, we know that. <laughs> um, I am so just. I am so thrilled to be my very first dual call at the same time it had to oh be God. you guys we're the first the first time i've had to connect two pe- two callers from two different locations we're I- honored uh, we are indeed well if it's going to be for anybody it would have to be for for jess oh thank you <laughs> you know uh, the co the co-directing i feel warrants, <laughs> warrants this. Well, you know, you know, you can always just take a bite out of something. Yeah, it it helps it helps to have a friend help you take a bite out of something. For <laughs> sure, too. And speaking of friend, I mean, I am so thrilled for the two of you. Um, for those Aww, of you, for thanks. those of you just tuning in, I have the wonderful Jess Weixler and Jennifer Prediger, the co-writers, co-directors, co-stars of the now called Apartment Troubles previously known as Trouble Dolls. And this was one of my hot picks at L.A. Film Festival. You guys know that. And I told you you'd get a distribution deal. I told you you would. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for always having faith in us, (laughs) Debbie. It's so nice to realize the movie is going to actually come out. I know. We had a special screening yesterday in New York at the Anthology Film Archives, and it was just so exciting to show the movie to the crew and the people who uh, added so much of their talent to our movie. And, um, yeah, it's just exciting to know that this Friday it's going to be in 10 theaters around the country and also on Video On Demand and also on iTunes. Just plugging it a little there, plug in. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Jess will tell you, I'm all, I'm all about the plugging, plugging, plugging everywhere, you know. It's you know. very helpful. 
There's so much out there. It's very nice when somebody takes the time to, you know, cheer you on a little. Yeah, and Jen, you just Thank mentioned, you. you know, the, the the crew and the people involved, you know, with the film, with the sc- New York screening. I got to say, the people that you got involved in your directorial debut, Megan Mullally, Jeffrey Tambor, Will Forte, even Lance Bass. <laughs> What? I love that it gets to land with Lance Bass. Even Lance Bass. <laughs> oh, don't don't forget Christopher Reed from Kid and Play. Oh, kids oh, yeah. from Kid and Play. True. Me- who else? Who else do you want to mention that, that you wrangled Thank into God. this? Names of Deirdre O'Connell. Oh my gosh, what an incredibly fine actress she is. The cats, Boba Fett. And Beetlejuice. But now, yes, now both th- of those famous cats. I even made a note to myself to make sure that I bring up the cats because, you know, I was just joking with the guys who did Lazarus Effect the other week because, you know, they got a dog. They're working with a dog and Mark Duplass. Um, mm-hmm. But here you're working with two cats. Now, how difficult was it wrangling cats? <laughs> we had very, um, you know, intelligent funny, good actor cats, so they mm-hmm. weren't too bad, and, and you can see kind of in the first scene with Jess and the cat, um, Boba Fett, that they had a wonderful rapport. They were a little feisty with each other, which uh, made for great on-screen uh, chemistry. I think we went a little method. I just make sh- I just made sure that that cat had a problem with me. We didn't hurt each other, but, you know, I just gave him looks so that he... He understood our dynamic. Well, and then, and then she would apologize. She would apologize. She yes. would say, and give him treats. And then be like, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, you know, when you, have, when you have a gas mask in hand, that kind of helps. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sure. you, the cat wanted to hit the gas mask. It's not me. See? It wasn't me. She was mad at The cat loved you. The cat just wanted to get to you uh. through the gas mask. Exactly, and Jeff did give him ample treats, and I think he was very pleased with those and seemed to have a good day of work. So now, for those that that don't know the movie, how did you come up with the story, uh, what is now Apartment Troubles, and how did it get changed, how did the title get changed? I really want to know, if you're allowed to say. (laughs) Title-wise, they just, our distributors, Gravitas, just sort of figured it was a better marketing decision, that it would reach a wider audience if, because everybody or so many people have apartments. And they're so nothing but trouble. Worth, just a marketing decision that made by... Not you. Gravitas. Made It was not made by you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and but we are grateful to them for the, the distribution of our movie, and we were like, sure, whatever... Whatever you think is best. So now, how did this whole idea of this story come come to be, take fruition? Because the story, uh, at the top, off the top of your head, it's like, okay, two roommates, yeah, they have money troubles, they, have, they don't really have jobs, the one is an artist that makes some really cool-looking art, by the way. We didn't talk about that back at the festival, Jess, but that, mm. that art, some of that is yeah. really very cool. I know. Our friend Amber Kelly is an incredible artist, and she is the mastermind behind much of the work that you see. And then also our set designer, um, Katie Hickman, and they those women just killed it and turned this apartment into this like magical, strange kind of Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass living room, messy concept art web. a six foot tall sand castle in in the living room. Um, this amazing sculpture of like it, it's a ladder that's filled with latex gloves that are filled with sand, and they're all piled on top of each other. And it's the weirdest looking thing. And um, Jess, so Jess's character named that latex misunderstanding, which <laughs> I always thought was very funny. <laughs> Unfortunately, that name didn't make it into the movie, but we will always know. It is called we'll latex know. misunderstanding. La- latex you never want to have a latex misunderstanding. Let no, me tell you. no, <laughs> no one wants to have a latex misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. No one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where did so, how did this how did you guys sit down? Did you just decide one day, hey, let's write a movie, and hey, <sighs> why don't we direct it? 
pretty yeah, much. Yeah, we met. <laughs> we, we had only met, though, a month before. I had come into town uh, to shoot Good Wife sort of last minute and didn't really have a place to stay. And Jenny was uh, traveling in, uh, through a fellow friend. I wound up in her apartment. And then when she came back from her other shoot, uh, shooting The Life of Crime, we became roommates and just sort of immediately had a similar sense of humor and just loved hanging out and lived in this crazy apartment where everything was really falling apart. Like there was, the bathroom was held together by duct tape, like the pipes were held together by duct tape. We were getting eviction notices on the door. We were both, it was sort of had become a doubly illegal sublet because she had illegally subletted it and I had illegally subletted it from her. And we let this apartment be like a a backdrop for the story. And then we had just always loved buddy movies, and we thought, well, if we're going to write something quickly, what if we just fashion this kind of after buddy movies that we love? And we had both separately fallen in love with this British cult film called With Nail and I, Mm -hmm. spelled W-I-T-H-N-A-I-L, with Nail and I, and we thought, let's do like an American female homage, and it and it it just sort of helped work as a framework for what kinds of characters and what kind of codependent relationship we were going to be showing in storytelling. How to make our characters as opposite as possible, with one being a real narcissist and the other one, be, you know, needing to be needed and all of that. Um, But we worked really fast, and it was fun because our producers had kind of said, you know, if you want to make this movie, we want to make it this summer. So we were really under under the gun in a good, fun way. It was like a challenge. We knew if we wanted to make this movie, we just had to do it. Yeah. Did you two always plan on directing? Yes, I think. Yeah, we we never considered anyone else to direct it, Um, and... You know, it was a really interesting experience to direct together and, um, you know, to have, so to have just recently met each other. And thankfully, Jess and I, nine times out of ten, agree on things and we, we get delighted and excited by the same things. And then, you know, one out of every ten times we're like, uh-uh, I don't like the color red there or whatever it is. And then, but I feel like it's been a really great Thing for me because neither of us really had uh, siblings growing up. I mean, I have a brother who's like eight years younger, but anyway, it was like we had this like sisterly negotiation that we had to do, and I think in the process we became better negotiators, collaborators, and and certainly very, very, very dear friends, which has been a nice like bonus. And I think our friendship isn't codependent like the one in the movie which is good we created a much healthier balanced friendship we are much better for each other than nicole and olivia yeah nicole yeah. nicole and olivia are, are kind of you know train wrecks in some respects yeah they, sure they need to grow they need to learn to stand on their own probably a little bit before they come back together yeah they got time they're young they got time yeah they got Thanks. time Thanks for saying they're young, Debbie. See? <laughs> I got your back. Don't worry. I got your back, you know. <laughs> now, how was it directing yourselves? Because in 90% of the film, you're on camera together. There's never one without the other. <laughs> but for a couple instances uh, with Megan Mullally, and otherwise, you're together. So how do you direct yourselves, especially as first-time directors? Do you just jump in feet first and say, hey, you, stand over there? Or... <laughs> We had, like, a whole sort of process where we would, um, well, when we were directing each other, we would, and this was Jess's idea, and I think it was brilliant, we would whisper in each other's ears so that it was very, like, intimate. We weren't yelling at each other across set or anything. Nobody was getting, like, dressed down in any way. And it, it was always just, like, a nice way to approach things. The crew probably thought we were talking about them. but um, So we would just give each other notes that way. Um, <laughs> very, very okay, cool we're going to tell the crew right now you were. it very intimate to be whispering. There, it, it sort of made our characters and us 
feel closer to just be like whispering to each other. What did you say, Debbie? Though you, I, I, I was, funny. I was saying, okay, now the crew is going to find out you really were whispering about them, but you know, <laughs> we weren't talking about them. Maybe occasionally. Like, like why is she wearing half the time? <laughs> you no, know, only half. Only mm-hmm. half. What was the most challenging thing for the two of you? Because having been in front of the camera before, you at least had a leg up over a lot of people. So you know from an acting standpoint what you need from a director. Did, mm. that, did that help? Did that hinder? Did that give you a little more confidence? Oh, I think so. I mean, it, it was definitely... I mean, in some ways with, with actors like Megan and Will and Jeffrey, you just don't want to get in their way. And, mm. But I think that's, that's often true of getting great performances out of people as you you sort of give enough hints that are have suggestions for the way a scene should go but you you really just try to create a space where people can do what they do very mm-hmm. well you know that that they can come up with their own ideas and um it was for sure intimidating to be like we're the directors of these people <laughs> like what right do we have <laughs> <laughs> to tell them what to do at all. Um, but they were so receptive to making it a collaborative process and just wanted to, like, brainstorm. So we, we kept it pretty pretty loose when we could. How, but how important was it to you to have Daniel Sharnoff there as your cinematographer? A hundred percent. It was everything, actually, to have another set of eyes because... Often we had to move so fast since we shot the whole thing in 14 days, we couldn't go back and look at the monitor or do playback. So we weren't always sure if mm-hmm. we had gotten it in the can, and we could really trust him to say, yeah, we can move on, because as soon as we could move on, we should move on. Mm-hmm. And um, other times he was like, no, you guys can do better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were grateful for that. So... As you sit back now, you've got your distribution, you're going to be in theaters, you're going to be on VOD, and everybody is going to fall in love with this film the way I did. Mm. What did you each learn about yourself in this directorial journey of making Apartment Mm. Troubles? Great question. We learned a lot, I would say. It was a big, growing experience. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, I feel like I learned how to share, and 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 maybe I I learned that I wasn't always the best at sharing. And I think getting to work side by side with Jess like really created a real um, need for true collaboration. And so like I couldn't just be like, no, I'll do it myself. <laughs> like it was like we were always doing things. Okay, side can we by hear that? Side. Can we hear that again, Jen? That was really good. <laughs> no, I'll do it. I'll. I don't need anybody. Um, <laughs> it was so great to like. You know, I mean, to, I feel like you know, as human beings, we're growing all the time. Hopefully, and go, embarking on a journey like this is a really big undertaking. And if you're not changed for the better in the process, then I think you've missed some of the point of it. And I feel like it. It really helps refine us. Um, as as human beings, as, as collaborators, but also, um, you know, as filmmakers, I, you just learn so much in your first film. It's such a huge learning curve, and I'm so grateful that we got to do that, and we got to do that together. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm so excited to make the next movie because I, I just learned so much from, from making this one. And what about yeah. for you, Jess? Yeah, it's such a beautiful thing to share because you really don't know what each day is going to be like exactly and and especially what each stage of it's going to be like. Like what is post-production going to be like? What is putting music to picture going to be like? All of these were firsts. And to be collaborating on it and also when each of us would take turns feeling confused or not being sure if we knew how to do something, we would really help pick each other up and be like, damn it, girl, you could do Yeah, <laughs> It was great. Um, we took turns that way a lot. And when one was down, the other would be up and vice versa. Like any 
any good relationship, you know. Yeah, we, we don't know really what we're doing right love. now, but we'll figure it out together. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be the best advice you could give to other first-time directors? Don't do it. No, uh, <laughs> do it. Just do it. Um, totally just do it, because I think you just have to learn on your feet. Yeah. You s- stay open to that it's not going to go the way you immediately imagine. You know, that, that the things better than that are going to happen. And that's what we found almost every day was what we had sort of imagined was better in reality because there were so many other people there to help. Like our, you know, our set designer, our costume designer. I mean, they all brought things to the movie that gave it that, you know, funky, cool feel. Um, yeah, just being like impressed and working with the people around us. So, are the two of you going to make a movie again together? I sure. hope so. I, I think maybe. We might make it in a different form. I don't know, like, it, it, we probably won't make Trouble Balls 2, but never say never. <laughs> uh, there's an Uncle Kent 2, which is a small indie movie I acted in the first and sequel of, which was pretty amazing that a sequel was made of it. So maybe there'll be Apartment Trouble 2, you know. You could be moving into Condo Troubles next. Oh, my gosh. Oh, or Mansion. Debbie, mansion you're a genius. Problem. Condo Troubles. Condo Troubles. <laughs> McMansion issues. Yeah, that's, see? See, Aunt Kimberly gives you the mansion. <laughs> she goes off to a tropical island, gives you the mansion. Lock, stock, and barrel. I would actually, that's a movie I'd like to see, Mansion <laughs> Issues. Mansion Issues. <laughs> well, okay, uh, we, have, we have solidified this. You have multiple ideas now to go forward with. Okay, so yes, the answer is yes, a movie is being made. Good. Starting right now. Well, ladies, it has been an absolute joy to talk to both of you again. You know you know, I love talking to you guys. You know, always. I mean, and anybody else looking to see you guys in other films, I know Jess, you know, Disappearance of Eleanor Rigby, all three parts, amazing job in all of it. Jen, Aww, you, thanks. you know, Life of Crime, it's a small part, but it's it's a cool little part as an assistant. Um, mm-hmm. You guys are just all over the place. You're all over the place. Thanks. thanks. And you're we'll fantastic. So stay in touch. I know you will. And Yes, you're the best, Debbie. It's uh, so sweet of you to do this with us. You know, anytime. Yeah. Anytime, you want, anytime you want to talk about any project you've got, you know, I'm here for you. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Thank you, girl. Apartment Troubles, Friday, in theaters, VOD. See it, buy it, rent it. Yeah. That about cover it? All right. Okay, I will talk to you both soon. Bye, Debbie. Bye, Bye. guys. And that was Jess Weixler, Jennifer Prediger, Apartment Troubles, in theaters Friday. We're running kind of late again today, as usual. I do want to get in... The interview sound clip with Hal Blaine and uh, Don Randy from my interview with them about the Wrecking Crew. And one of the big issues that comes up in film a lot is, especially with music, do you need classical training? So many musicians today say, no, you don't need classical training. A lot of the composers, the John Williams, the Aaron Zygmunds, yes, you need classical training no matter what it is you're going to score or create for a film. And here are two rock and roll wrecking crew legends and this is what they had to say about the importance of classical training for studio musicians film musicians overrated really <laughs> yeah i find i'm glad i had the training See, i've got two different generations here so yes this is good the reason i say it's overrated uh, i'll tell you I'll give you a for instance. I, I did a seminar out at Cal State Fullerton. They had three bands, A band, B band, and C band. Mm-hmm. The A band was the best readers and, and great players. They were wonderful. The B band was okay. The C band had the best players in them, and none of them could read. Wow. Mm. But those guys were hungry. Mm-hmm. They wanted it. They could possibly become the best readers. But man, those two kids got out, a trumpet player and a saxophone player, and they went, oh my God, 
but they weren't good enough to be in the A band. They were good enough to play every solo that would come up in the A band, but they couldn't play their parts. They couldn't play to it, so they had to develop. It's a perfect example. Uh, you you want to? You can have all the training you want. If somebody asks you to do something, and you don't know what they're talking about, then what do you do with your training? Mm-hmm. Stick it up your ass. It doesn't mean anything. But if you turn your radio on and you listen to more than one station, and you and you have some knowledge of what could possibly be going on, and you hear, you know, what a rock and roll drummer should sound like, and you hear what this, and you know where it's coming from. That's the important part of it. You can utilize the technique from classical music, but the knowledge of music is you have to learn. You have to be listening, and you never stop learning. You never, you never know. You always want to find out something else. Somebody must throw a piece of music in front of you that, wow, this is brilliant, you know, or this is not so brilliant, and you make it brilliant. And, and that happens over and over again. But I think because only the cla- classically trained... <laughs> Yeah, it's overrated. <laughs> well, the thing is, when you're classically trained, the word practice comes in. Those people, and I know so many of those people, they used to practice from morning to night. They ate, slept, and drank their instrument. What it was all about, not just how to play, but why it played and why it sounded like, and you knew everything, every nut and screw in your instrument. and. Today, today is one of those, what do you call it, today's generation? Yeah. They want it now, right now, right now. Yeah, I want to get a set of drums. Well, what are you going to do with it? You go around your neighborhood and you'll find a set of drums in every garage of parents that their kid wanted to play the drums because he played the drums for 15 minutes, so to speak, and they wound up in a garage. Mm. You it's know, amazing. Well, I, I, Classically I, trained, though, I, I, it's because they knew technically everything. We were auditioning bands, uh, drummers, to play in my band at the club. Mm-hmm. And we had listened to a whole bunch. Kid comes in, sets up nine million drums that Jeff Percaro set up with the racks and all that stuff. And we're all standing outside, and this kid's playing, and we're like, oh, oh my God. I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, the chops were unbelievable. Okay, so we all come running in, we sit down. He can't play with a band. <laughs> because he's been in his garage, and that's all he can play with. Now play with four other people. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Couldn't do it. You can't do that. You have, you to, have to see that movie. <laughs> Whiplash. Have seen it. And Brian is driving me crazy in here, grinning a silly grin. So that is our, that is our music to to get out of here. It has been a pleasure. I want to thank Kelly Pratt so much for calling in, talk about TCM Film Festival with me, and her role as a social producer on the ground in Hollywood. Everybody can follow uh, Kelly's tweets at Irish Jayhawk sixty six. Uh, and find out what's happening uh, on the ground during the festival. And then Jen Prediger, Jess Weixler, I love them both. Apartment Troubles in theaters Friday and on VOD. Get it, buy it, see it. You'll love it. Uh, next week, we I promise you, you'll get to hear from Seymour Bernstein and from Todd Lieberman and a few more surprises. And Greg will be back. So, thank you all for coming behind the lens today. We'll see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.